दिस इज चिन्मय देवगावकर प्रेसिडेंट विथ एफ एस टी एम मुंबई चैप्टर एंड वेलकम टू दिस सीरीज यू नो बाय फूड टेकी शेरपास वी आर विच इज जॉइंटली रन बाय एफ एस टी एम मुंबई एंड चेंबर फॉर एडवांसमेंट ऑफ स्मॉल एंड मीडियम बिजनेस कैस एम बी विच इज कॉल्ड यू नो इन शॉर्ट एंड टू गिव यू सम around about afsti it's about uh, 80 plus year old association uh, having you know about 8000 plus uh, uh, professionals as a, as its members afsti mumbai chapter is around 50 years old and uh, we organize we basically do the bridge between industry regulators academicians and profession and the professionals so uh, we run number of activities and uh, conferences Uh, education series for students uh, internship program uh, job drive there are multiple things that we do for this uh, you know fraternity of food scientists and technologists casmb is um, about 2 years old and the center is developed with uh, you know uh, for anything required for enhancement small micro small and medium scale industry and it runs number of activities with um, we support the medium uh, small and medium scale industries uh, dr i mean nilesh lele is here but he is unable to speak right now so he has asked me to take over uh, so uh, nilesh uh, if there is any question about casmb you are requested to put it in the chat if you are not able to you know talk but casmb is something that um, every micro you know micro small and medium scale industry can look up to for all all kinds of support so what are the benefits so we also have you know various membership programs and student membership is one of such activity so what is the you know so people generally student generally ask us what is the benefit of having student you know, membership with fsti so we have you know so when you join fsti you do networking with all the professionals uh, you can we you know we support the you know startups we have mentoring activities we have various awards we have you know you can uh uh you can join the conferences at discounted rates and multiple other things like poster competition paper competition we support in professional development etc so there are number of benefits for students and uh, we encourage students to join the fsti um as student member so that you can be part of the fraternity and avail various benefits of the association Uh, next slide uh, next slide uh, samiksha so these are the initiatives uh, when it comes to events we have ifcon and ifcost uh, ifcost is happening in december in mumbai this year and uh, normally it is both the events are attended by approximately 3000 plus uh, participants out of his, out of his majority are students we conduct various regulatory summits which means we do it with the regulators who explain their way of you know understanding of regulation to the industry uh we do you know we have partner events with fi india annapurna uh, us chickpe council us sac uh, dairy and other many other uh, columnesi now we have with anuga india and then we do nutrition week world food day world food safety day and many other such activities so uh, the calendar is always published on our website uh, next slide it's our pleasure to welcome dr uh, mr vikram kelkar who is managing director with hexagon and uh, to give you background about dr vikram i mean uh, we have he's he's awarded as uh, the visionary of uh, india uh, which means that uh, uh, you know which means that the and this award is given by uh, none other than the public relations council of india and this award is for outstanding innovation in irradiation and micronutrient uh, micronutrient deficiencies Dr Vikram uh, has widely traveled across 50 countries a very vast experience and he is also elected member of governing council of the EPCES which is export promotion council for EOUs and SEZ under ministry of commerce and industry he is also co-author of research paper titled asian wheat flour products impact of flour fortification on organoleptic properties and uh, vikram holds a bachelor degree of management studies and in from university of mumbai and master of international business from uh, university of auckland and it's really my personal pleasure also to welcome uh, vikram uh, you know for this conference uh, for this age series session 
and uh, you know something that always uh, you know i get amazed by that you know your degree your background and your work experience and your expertise is completely different and i and you know in this 20 years you have seen the complete sea change i mean it's your normally uh, you know a question in the mind that our ancestors lived without any fortification they ate only normal you know non natural food so why there is need for fortification so all ears to you vikram for you know listening to your exciting journey and your expertise and how this food fortification is going to help india over to you dr vikram thank you so much chinmay i mean uh, i am amazed with this wonderful introduction uh, for me and uh, let me tell you that afsti has been doing a fantastic job for decades uh, in fact uh, i am myself exposed to afsti since uh, 25 years uh, much before even i joined the company and as you said that you know my background is not from food technology or uh, you know it's in management but uh, uh, you know even even though being in that faculty uh, i used to attend uh, some uh, events of avsti at uh, udct and uh, at some other locations uh, thanks to uh, you know my father uh, you know who has been very active uh, you know in the industry so i got the chance to to, to visit with him so uh, i mean it's great that you know the legacy is being carried forward uh, you know under your leadership this year and yeah. uh, uh my best wishes to all the members of the, of the of the governing council for fsti for this fantastic job and uh, as uh, you know i was reached out about a month ago uh, regarding this event the moment i came to know that uh, you know this event is being organized for the students and food technologists i readily agreed um, because i think this is one of the best ways to give back Uh, you know to 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 the society uh, through the knowledge because i remember when i was a student uh, i still remember everything that was that the speakers came and spoke so uh, i think uh, students have the amazing ability to grasp you know whatever um, they are being taught so uh, without further ado uh, let me get started uh, with my uh, presentation today so it's on food fortification uh, and its role in nutrition and health so next slide please Yeah, yeah when we come to fortification it is first important to understand why we are doing fortification and one of the biggest reasons is you know the prevalence of malnutrition and what is malnutrition malnutrition refers to the deficiencies excesses or imbalances in a person's intake of vital nutrients it is important to combat malnutrition and for that we need innovative approaches to improve the nutrition outcomes next slide please looking at the deficiency status the comprehensive national nutrition survey shows that 67.1% of the children under 5 suffer from anemia underscoring severe micronutrient malnutrition deficiencies in iron vitamin b12 and folic acid cause stunted growth higher infection rates and maternal and child health risks imposing economic burdens so if you see the global hunger index severity scale you know we stand at the score of 29.1 which is serious and india's nutritional puzzle is the tackling the deficiencies together for that we need good investment in health and nutrition for women and children better fund utilization and an outcome focused approach to nutrition programs the sustainable development goals that is the sdgs and the nfhs 5 show progress while government initiatives like poshan abhiyan aim to reduce stunting undernutrition and anemia next slide please so who is at risk it is the women infants children and adolescents that are at particular risk of malnutrition optimizing nutrition early in life including the 1000 days from conception to a child's second birthday ensures the best possible start in life with long term benefits poverty amplifies the risks of and risks from malnutrition people who are poor are more likely to be affected by different forms of malnutrition also malnutrition increases healthcare costs reduces productivity and slows economic growth which can perpetuate a cycle of poverty and ill health next slide please 
So coming to malnutrition, let's understand the different forms of malnutrition. One is the undernutrition and the second is the overnutrition. In undernutrition, we have issues like stunting, underweight, wasting, micronutrient deficiencies. Whereas in overnutrition, we have issues like obesity, overweight, and also the non-communicable diseases. So which are some of the strategies that can help in combating malnutrition? So they are exclusive best feeding till six months, introduction of complementary feeding after six months, growth monitoring and promotion, micronutrient supplementation, diet diversification, food fortification, nutrition education, and the reduction of high fat, sugar, and salty foods, elimination of the trans fats, and making healthier food options available, and also being physically active. Next slide, please. <laughs> Let us understand the importance of nutrition. So first is for physical development. Nutrition helps in building strong muscles and bones and ensuring normal physiological functions. Then the second is the cognitive development. Adequate nutrition in early childhood is crucial for cognitive performance and learning abilities. Then we have the immune function where proper nutrition strengthens the immune system, reducing the risk of infections and diseases and also the health and well-being. It helps in preventing chronic diseases such as diabetes, heart disease and certain cancers. Next slide please. So coming to food fortification as an effective solution. Food fortification is a scientifically proven, cost-effective and scalable intervention that can play a crucial role in reducing the burden of micronutrient malnourishment in India. Next slide, please. So what is food fortification? Food fortification is the process of deliberately increasing the content of essential micronutrients in food to improve its nutritional quality and provide a public health benefit with minimal health risk. And which are the types of food fortification? We have the mass fortification, which is also called as a large scale food fortification. So it refers to the fortification of staple foods like salt, flour, and rice, which are consumed by the general population to address widespread micronutrient deficiencies. Then we have the targeted fortification. The fortification of foods is aimed at specific population groups, such as children, pregnant women, or the elderly who are higher risk of deficiencies. Then we have the market-driven fortification, which is the voluntary fortification by manufacturers to enhance the nutrition value of their products, often drive, driven by consumer demand or marketing strategies. Next slide, please. Now coming to why fortification. So it's the hidden hunger for which fortification is required. And hidden hunger is a phrase that seems incongruous and a concept that seems impossible. How can hunger be hidden? Would not one not feel the gnawing of the hunger pangs, the vastness of an empty stomach? Apparently no. Then how is this hunger? How is this hidden? So the World Health Organization defines hidden hunger as a lack of vitamins and minerals. This occurs when the quality of food eaten does not meet the nutrient requirements. We may not feel hungry, but our bodies feel this hidden hunger and our health suffers regardless. So food fortification is a promising strategy to reduce hidden hunger that has been proven effective historically. It is time for us to scale up so that no Indian suffers as a result of this hidden hunger. Next slide, please. So looking at the food fortification timeline. So food fortification, as we see, you know, from this, uh, you know, slide is that it's, it's not new. It has been happening as early as 1918, where in Canada, there was mandatory fortification of oils, fat and milk with vitamin D. Then we, uh, it was uh, started in 1923 uh, as mandatory salt for iodization in Switzerland and USA, and then followed by several other countries, including the sugar fortification with vitamin A in Guatemala in 1974. And then uh, even, uh, you know, several African countries started fortification as early as 
year 2000, wherein there was mandatory fortification in Nigeria and even South Africa in 2003 mandated the fortification of wheat flour, maize meal, brown bread and white bread. And even in India, if you see, fortification is actually not a very new concept because it was started as early as 1953 with the mandatory fortification of Vanaspati ghee with vitamin A. And in 1962, we started the salt iodization as a national program. So uh, while uh, fortification is not new to India, it has it was restricted to only you know two uh, you know products. And uh, uh, while you know we have been slightly late in implementation of the food fortification in India, uh, nevertheless there has been some progress in the last few years, which we will see now. Next slide, please. So looking at the strategic advantages of fortification, which uh, I will explain uh, in my next slide. Can we move on? Yeah, so what are the strategic advantages of fortification? So staple foods that are consumed regularly by all, that is wheat flour, oil, milk, rice, and salt are best suited for fortification. Fortification is scientifically proven, simple, and low cost technology. It is a preventive population wide approach through which the fortified foods can be made available to the entire population, including those served through PDS, ICDS, and MDM programs. Since staple foods are centrally processed and micronutrients are added in very low doses, fortification poses no risk of excessive intake. There is no change in color, taste, texture, or quality of staples. There is high bioavailability of micronutrients and a gradual impact without requiring behavioral change. And micronutrients added to staple foods have a high stability during cooking and storage. Next slide, please. So coming at the nutraceutical or nutrition landscape, so that includes the fortified staples and functional foods, dietary supplements, and therapeutic foods. Next slide, please. So staple foods that are currently being fortified and they are the salt, rice, oil, wheat flour, maida and milk. And the standards for fortification of staple foods, uh, which includes oil, milk, wheat flour, rice and double fortified salt are already in place in India. And while edible oil and milk is fortified with vitamin A and D, edible salt is fortified with iron and iodine. Whereas rice, maida, and wheat flour are being fortified with iron, folic acid, and B12. And we have this F plus logo you know, on the products, which uh, help consumers to identify the fortified products. Next slide, please. So yeah, this is exactly what we have discussed in the previous slide. Yeah. Then coming to rice fortification. So rice is the staple food of 65% of the Indians and staple food for poor sections of the society as well. So the common, it's commonly fortified with iron, folic acid, and B12, and the rice fortification is cost-effective as well. Next one. Yeah, coming to the wheat flour fortification, and India is ranked second with the consumption of 102 million metric ton of wheat in 2019. Wheat is also a major staple crop and it, the wheat flour is fortified with iron, folic acid, and B12. And wheat flour fortification is also cost effective. Next slide, please. Coming to the fortification of milk, India has very high burden of vitamin A and D deficiencies. And both these vitamins are fat soluble. Fortification of milk with vitamin A and D is a strategic move to tackle micronutrient deficiency as India is the largest producer of milk in the world with 146.3 million tons of production and per capita availability of 322 grams per day. Next slide, please. Coming to the fortification of edible oil, deficiencies of vitamin A and D are high prevalence in India and fortified edible oil is expected to provide 25 to 30% of the recommended dietary allowances for vitamin A and D. Next one. Coming to the double fortified salt, 
India's National Nut Institute of Nutrition (NIN) has developed the DFS, that is the double fortified salt. And in 2009, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has endorsed addition of iron in double fortified salt at 0.8 to 1.1 mg per gram of salt in your daily diet. And success of iodization of salt in India, since 92% of the population consumes now iodized salt. Next one. Let's understand how fortification is cost effective. What are the uh, uh, you know uh, calculations when it comes to fortification? So the cost of fortificants can range from uh, 20 rupees to 100 rupees to 45 per metric ton of the end product, or which is actually just about two to ten paisa per kg of food, depending on the type and number of micronutrients added. At the small chakki levels, the cost of flour fortification is about 40 to 50 paisa per kg of wheat flour, as the premix has to be further diluted to ensure proper blending. But if you look at the commercial large um, industrial mills, then you know the cost is very low, which we'll see now. So coming to the food commodity, uh, what is the cost of fortification per kg in rupees? So when it comes to wheat flour, it is as low as 8 paisa to 10 paisa per kg. When it comes to milk, it is as low as 1.5 paisa per kg of milk. And in edible oil, it is about 10 to 15 paisa per kg of edible oil. So this is you know, the cost effectiveness of fortification. Next slide. So coming to the fortification of processed foods, which are the categories uh, we look here are the cereal products like breakfast cereals, pasta and noodles, and bakery items like bread, biscuits, rusks, buns, and fruit juices. So whereas these cereal products can be fortified with iron, folic acid, and B12 within the range given, the fruit juices are fortified with vitamin C. Then we move on to the next. Yeah, let's look at the updated RDA 2020 values. The Food Safety and Standards Authority of India, the FSSAI, revised the recommended dietary allowance RDA values for vitamins and minerals in nutraceuticals. This was to come in force from July 1, 2023. And the manufacturing companies can alter the daily dosage of essential vitamins and minerals in their nutraceutical products. Based on revised nutrient requirements for Indians uh, at 2020, the dosage should not exceed the RDA limits. And the products that exceeded the RDA limits will need to be sold as pharmaceutical products instead of a nutraceutical. And as we can see, some of the RDAs which have been changed are the RDA of vitamin C, which has increased from 40 mg to 80 mg for men and 40 mg to 65 mg for women. The RDA for, for zinc went up from 12 mg to 17 mg for men and 10 mg to 13.2 mg for women. And the RDA of sodium has been reduced from 2100 mg to 2000 mg for men, but increased for, from 1900 mg to 2000 mg for women. Next slide, please. So uh, looking at the fortification of processed foods and bakery wares, uh, we have already seen earlier uh, that uh, they are to be fortified with iron, folic acid, and vitamin B12. But there are also some other optional ingredients that they can be fortified with, like zinc, vitamin A, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, and pyridoxine. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, so this is the same category. We can move on to the next. Yes, again the same. Please move on to the next. Yeah, coming to the fortification of processed food, which is the fruit juices. So uh, the fruit juices can be fortified uh, with 6 mg to 12 mg of vitamin C per 100 ml. Next slide. And let's look at the other food applications that are being fortified. So we have nutrition bars, gummies, seasoning mixes. We have the nutritional supplements and also the plant-based beverages. Next slide, please. Let's look at the challenges and opportunities in food fortification. So some of the challenges are the technical issues like stability, bioavailability, achieving uniform distribution of nutrients in fortified foods to ensure the consistent intake, then we have the regulatory and quality control, 
that is developing and enforcing robust regulatory frameworks to ensure that the fortified foods meet the established standards. Then consumer acceptance, addressing any perceptions of change in taste, color, or quality due to fortification. And then we have the challenge of the prevalence of malnutrition. Approximately 34.7% of the children under five are stunted. 17.3% are wasted and 33.4% are underweight as per the National Family Health Survey. But then, you know, these are also, the challenges also give rise to opportunities. So the opportunities that we have are the technological advancements which are happening in the area of ingredients and food fortification. Then we have the policy support, you know, from the governments, which is now promoting uh, fortification. And then the tremendous public health impact that fortification can have, uh, you know, after it is implemented. Next slide, please. So coming to nutraceuticals, what are nutraceuticals? The term nutraceuticals, yeah, can we move on to the, yeah, yeah, thank you. So the term nutraceutical was coined from nutrition and pharmaceutical in 1989 by Stephen DeFelis. A food or part of food that provides medical or health benefits, including the prevention and or treatment of a disease. So the philosophy behind nutraceuticals is to focus on prevention and let food be thy medicine. Next slide. Coming to the hierarchy of nutritional needs. So nutrition related needs of population segments can be viewed as a hierarchy of foundation, condition specific and enhancement needs. So looking at the enhancement needs, we have the nutrition requirements of overnourished people with enhanced nutrient and calorie intake due to their special requirements such as professional sports, heavy exercise, extensive outdoor field work, etc. So these nutrition needs are for enhanced functioning. If you look at the condition specific needs, it is the nutrition requirements prevalent in people largely across the micronutrient deficient segments during specific conditions such as nutrient specific deficiency due to the lower intake, pregnancy, menstruation, postmenopause, obesity, stressful lifestyle and sedentary lifestyles. So these nutrition needs are for addressing specific conditions. Looking at the foundation needs, which is the mass population. So these are the nutrition which is required, uh, needed by all the segments of the population to maintain and promote a normal, healthy life. And these nutrition needs are for maintaining normalcy of being. Next slide, please. So let us look at the nutritional status of the population in India. In India, we have widespread nutritional imbalances which are contributing to various health risks, which is resulting in adverse outcomes that lead to a productivity loss of approximately 1% of the GDP. And we have a vast undernourished population of about 380 million that is struggling to meet the basic nutritional needs for maintaining normalcy. And then another sizable group, which is 570 million, which is consuming enough calories but lacks essential nutrients, increasing the risk of becoming the world's epicenter for cardiovascular and diabetes mellitus and diabetic related issues. And then we have a smaller segment of 80 million, which is consuming excessive nutrients and calories due to heightened physical requirements. Next slide, please. Yeah, so we have the winds of change and uh, it is important that uh, the consumers are getting more and more aware. So we are looking towards the positive health. Next slide. So let us look at the framework for nutraceutical regulations by FSSAI. So the Food Safety and Standards uh, Authority, uh, they have actually come up with the draft regulations uh, during March 2022 for health supplements, nutraceuticals, food for special dietary use and food for special medical purposes and functional food and novel foods. And the categories are health supplements, nutraceuticals, foods for special dietary use, FSDU, 
food for special medical purposes, FSMP, prebiotic food, and probiotic food. Next slide, please. So coming to the schedules under the draft regulations in nutraceuticals, we have schedule one, which deals with the nutrients, which are the vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and other nutrients. Then we have the schedule two, which deals with the plant or botanical ingredients. And we have the schedule three, which deals with the molecules, isolates, extracts, other than schedule two. And then coming to the schedule four, we have the prebiotics and probiotics. Next slide, please. This is the major issue that is now come up and the government panel is to review whether nutraceuticals should be bought um, under the Apex Drug Regulator, CDSCO or the FSSCI. So the regulation covers food items that are specially processed or formulated for specific nutritional or dietary purposes. And presently the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India regulates the usage of health supplements and nutraceuticals under the Food Safety and Standards. And uh, uh, it, it, is, uh, it would be desirable that uh, FSSAI continues to, to regulate this uh, area of nutraceuticals, although, uh, you know, discussion is on, um, you know, for that. Next slide, please. So coming to the nutraceutical spectrum, which we saw earlier, we have fortified staples and functional foods, dietary supplements and new therapeutic foods, which we'll review further. Next slide. Looking at the key market segmentation, so looking at the product types, uh, what are the types of products in the market when it comes to nutraceuticals? So they are having uh, the products which are containing proteins, vitamins and minerals, herbals and others. Coming to the forms, which are the various forms? Those are tablets, capsules, powders, liquids, soft gels, gel caps. Coming to the distribution channels, so we have distribution through the pharmacies and drug stores supermarkets and hypermarkets, online channels and others. And in the product type, we can see that the vitamins and minerals are exhibiting the clear dominance. When it comes to forms, we have tablets which are exhibiting the clear dominance. And then in distribution channel, we have the pharmacies and drugstores which are you know, exhibiting the clear dominance. Next slide. Coming to key market segmentation, if you look at from the end user's point of view, we have infants, children, adults, elderly and pregnant and lactating women. And if you look at the applications, we have sports nutrition, weight loss, immunity, digestive health, bone and joint and heart health. Next slide. Coming to the growth drivers. What are the growth drivers? So we have awareness, of increasing health consciousness among the consumers. We have increase in the lifestyle diseases, sedentary lifestyle, rising disposable incomes, rising geriatric population, increased healthcare costs and interest in preventive healthcare, upgradation of the healthcare infrastructure, access and ease of availability, improving distribution networks, e-commerce platforms enhance visibility, wider reach and a plethora of options. Then we have got the growing fitness centers, gyms and health clubs. So these are all the growth factors for the nutraceutical industry. Next slide, please. Coming to the industry market trends, we have now innovative delivery formats. Gone are the days of the traditional ways of taking nutraceuticals, but now we have them in gummies, chewable uh, with flavors in gels and uh, jellies, oral thin strips, soft candies, bars and bites. So th there is a solution now to the pill fatigue and elimination of colors and additives with the new delivery formats. Next slide, please. So uh, if you look at the uh, market industry trends, uh, you know, there's a lot of innovation that is happening in the way the supplements are looking as we see these transparent, uh, you know, capsules which are having liquid as well as the powders in it and uh, different types of combinations um, which are there. And uh, it's, it's, it gives that uh, cool factor to the vitamins now and uh, the visual aesthetics are also attractive Insta-worthy products for the millennials. 
Next slide, please. Yeah. So we see that the healthcare sector is evolving, giving rise to transversal and innovative market segments, blurring the boundaries among the traditional segments. So we have a lot of new terms that which are coming, um, you know, in the, in the industry, uh, like cosmeceutical, which is a combination of cosmetics and pharmaceuticals. Then we have nutraceutical, which we all have been hearing, which is a, you know, um, a, a combination of nutrition and pharmaceutical. And then we have got neutra cosmetical, which is a combination of cosmetics and nutrition. And then, you know, uh, uh, you know, which uh, uh, set which includes all the three that is called neutra cosmeceutical, which includes the cosmetics, pharmaceuticals and nutrition. So there is a lot of uh, integration and interdependence on, on these segments and a lot of new products are coming up with these new terminologies. Next slide, please. So let's look at the market challenges. What are the market challenges that we are facing? So the, if you come to the challenging regulatory environments, there's a need for governmental intervention and the strengthening of regulations pertaining to the dis production, distribution, safety, and testing. And then claims regarding the effectiveness of dietary supplements. Then there is a huge threat of counterfeit dietary supplements. An increase in the influx of counterfeit and fake supplements into the market is a big problem. Manufacturing, you know, which is the products which are manufactured using low cost, non standard materials and are not tested or approved by regulatory authorities. Therefore, they are unfit for human consumption. Then we have consumer distrust, which is the use of, um, you know, deceptive advertising and communication strategies aimed at claiming the health benefits of taking supplements that has led to a growing distrust of consumers towards the entire sector. And then we have high prevalence of inadequate knowledge despite of the positive attitude. So what is the way forward? Coming to the recommendations, uh, it includes strengthening the regulatory frameworks, increasing awareness, investing in research and development, and enhancing monitoring and evaluation. And if you look at the strategic and actions, they include collaborations and partnerships, scaling up of the operations, addressing the data gaps, and indulging in technologies. Next slide, please. So coming to Hexagon Nutrition, so apart from uh, you know providing fortificants uh, for the food and beverage industry, we are also into the nutraceutical segment, which includes the uh, you know, the products for the clinical nutrition and also certain uh, over-the-counter products that we do. Pentasure is our brand name. We have Obesigo and Pedia Gold. Next slide, please. Then we have launched a new, uh, some OTC brands uh, like Neutron uh, for men, women, and also the healthy aging and as well as the sports nutrition. Next slide. Yeah, this is a very interesting project that I would like to talk about, uh, uh, you know, for uh, for everyone's benefit. So Hexagon Nutrition about three years ago, uh, you know, uh, entered into a memorandum of understanding with the National Institute for Food Technology and Entrepreneurship Management, um, which is at uh, Haryana uh, in, in a place called Kundli. And uh, INIFTEM has been uh, recognized by the government of India as an institute of national importance, just like uh, how uh, we have the IITs and the IIMs. So uh, Hexagon uh, has uh, collaborated uh, for establishing the Center of Excellence for Food Fortification at NIFTEM. So what Hexagon has done is that uh, Hexagon has provided pilot scale fortification plants for wheat flour, rice as well as edible oil at NIFTEM and it has also trained the staff at NIFTEM for its operation, operationalization as well as the maintenance of the equipment and also helped to develop the training modules for fortification and the result of this is that in, in the in the past uh, you know couple of years it has we have been able to train more than 4000 individuals um, you know, from the student fraternity, uh, the food technologists, uh, the industry from the small scale and the medium scale, as well as government officials uh, 
uh, for uh, you know one or two days uh, certificate programs uh, for fortification. So I think uh, uh, this is a great center, um, which uh, you know whenever you get a chance to visit, please do visit and and see for yourself. Uh, you know uh, what, what is uh, what we have done. So next slide, please. Yeah, uh, coming to you know our collaboration with um, Millers for Nutrition, uh, which is also supported by TechnoServe. So we have the global partnership on staple food fortification with a special focus on wheat flour fortification. So Millers for Nutrition is actively working to uh, promote and facilitate fortification in eight countries, which includes India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Indonesia, Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Nigeria. And we are very hopeful that, uh, yeah, you know, with this uh, collaboration, we are able to reach to much more vulnerable populations with uh, fortified staples. Next slide, please. Yes, so coming to the last part of the presentation, that is the conclusion. So innovation is more important than ever to meet persistent needs ensure engagement and win loyal customers. And we need to develop educational strategy to increase public awareness of the rational use of nutraceuticals. We need to address the wide spectrum of behavioral characteristics and a strong improved regulatory environment is required to avoid counterfeit products and ensure the safety of the food products. And then finally, making the link between dietary supplements, disease mitigation, and self-care with strong scientific evidence. Next slide, please. So the trend in preventive medicine has shifted towards self-care. This is the final word from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yes, yes. Chennai, ma'am, you were saying something. No, no, no. I, I was, I was just saying. I mean, it was really amazing. It was really interesting. And uh, Samiksha, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess first we should take the question answers, and then, uh, you know, we can. Uh, Certainly, you know, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Vikram sir, indeed, uh, you have very insightfully delved into the strategic, technological, policy based all aspects of food fortification. Thank you for that. We have uh, many questions in the chat box. I'll start with a general question uh, that Chumi ma'am posted, actually. Can what I start with questions, Samiksha? Sure, sure, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, hello. Yeah. I'm yeah. a friend of your father, Dr. Kondekar. Yes, yes, Dr. Kondekar, <laughs> wonderful to see you yeah. and hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nowadays, uh, on TV, we see one ad of Puro Salt. Mm -hmm. And they claim that there are 84 minerals into that. Is mm -hmm. it a fact? How can it? <laughs> well, <laughs> no, just, well, just for the sake of knowledge, that's all, nothing. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, fair enough. Uh, so, so these are some of the areas that need to be really dealt with uh, appropriately. And, uh, you know, adherence to any claims has to be justified and backed up, you know. No, uh, that, that is okay. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> that is okay. I just yeah. wanted to know, can it be possible? Uh, yeah, well, 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 if they are claiming it, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it may be possible that 84 minerals uh, sounds a bit... Yeah. Uh, Little bit too much. Yeah, <laughs> so, that's what that's yeah, what yeah. I was wondering. <laughs> I don't think I don't. I, I we, right, we need, right. It needs uh, to be looked I, at. I also agree with you. Yes, yeah, thank yes. you. Thank you. So thank much. you for nice presentation. I was traveling and now yeah. I came home, so Wonderful. I can specifically, Wonderful. particularly asking this question. That's all. Sure, sure. All the no, best. No, no. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Bye. Yeah, Thank bye. you, Pandeka, sir, for that question. Uh, so we go ahead with the questions in the chat box. Uh, yeah. What is the difference between uh, fortified food and health supplements? Like in a general approach, how would you differentiate it? Okay, uh, so fortified food. Um, so when we talk about fortified food, it is, uh, as we explained during the presentation, that fortified food includes the addition of uh, 
you know micronutrients to the foods uh, to enhance its nutritional value and also to compensate for the losses of the micronutrients during the processing so fortified foods uh, you know are uh, you know the the foods that we are consuming generally and regularly whereas health supplements are a more concentrated form of uh, um, uh, you know products which are uh, used for specific uh, reasons yeah so uh, we have uh, you know uh, the uh, uh, you know people going to the gym who uh, consume these uh, you know whey protein supplements uh, we have uh, you know these multivitamin tablets which which we are taking for our uh, uh, daily health so i think this is primarily the difference uh, health supplements are uh, products that are created to be consumed directly whereas uh, fortified foods are uh, foods which are you know being added with vitamins and minerals uh, for fortification thank you thank you sir and the question is uh, how should the existing and future uh, public private partnerships manage conflicts of interest and fill gaps with respect to food fortification is there a recipe for success <laughs> yes uh, i mean this is a question which i i i you know do come across uh, in in a, a lot of forums and uh, if you see you know the business sector has been involved in projects aimed at uh, preventing and treating malnutrition as well as creating nutrient rich and fortified foods yes yeah sorry sorry i just uh, Uh, yeah so and then uh, we have private sector actors uh, which have engaged in and continue to engage in destructive practices as a result of lack of confidence differing goals objectives working cultures and deadline expectations public private engagement remains challenging complex and multi dimensional issues such as the double burden of malnutrition are increasingly recognized as requiring cross sectoral and holistic treatments governments must maintain control as the legislative and regulatory authority while bringing together and pooling of the resources information and experience of many stakeholders furthermore evidence based engagement between the governments civil society and commercial sector is critical more attention should be paid to governance and organizational structures how they are dealing with the power imbalances distinctive dialects and jargons values what do you mean by monitoring and evaluation these lessons if recorded in a systematic manner can aid in the establishment of a framework that will allow jurisdictions to take up evidence based approach to evaluating partnership development opportunities within the food industry thank you thank you sir a uh, a uh, question from a very uh, nice point of view sir uh, you explained how low cost it is to fortify foods so mm-hmm. why don't we make fortification essentially compulsory for all essential foods and why is it only compelled on certain selected foods hmm uh, so uh, i mean uh, if you see here uh, why it is for certain selected foods it is because you know uh, products like staples are widely consumed by uh, you know uh, the majority of the population and this is a very easy channel you know to reach the masses rather than you know looking at uh, you know certain selective foods which can be fortified uh, it is uh, you know in, in the national interest it is uh, important that uh, we go for the uh, you know large scale food fortification for the staples uh, like rice oil milk uh, wheat flour sugar which are consumed by the masses okay thank you sir yeah. uh, yeah. a related question what in your opinion is the perfect way to scale up and sustain the fortification of staples and processed foods like fortification on bakery breakfast cereals beverages etc um right uh, so food fortification uh, which is relatively easy to scale up and maintain might become a powerful weapon in india's fight against malnutrition fortification is widely utilized over the world and with the changing structure of the food industry and changing behavioral patterns such as the shift away from subsistence agriculture 
urbanization and the inclusion of women in the workforce more and more people are relying on the packaged foods increased fortification will boost the population's consumption of important nutrients that is why organizations like fssci and other development sectors have made it a priority fortification of staple foods uh, is a safe cost effective and evidence based way to ensure that everyone even the most vulnerable members of the society have access to the vital micronutrients it is a successful strategy for combating malnutrition that should be scaled up with the help of a multi stakeholder coalition the perfect way to scale up and sustain food fortification is via its widespread adoption awareness to create the demand pull and pushing of the fortified staples through public distribution system that is the pds and social safety net programs fssci has set the norms for processed food applications like bakery wares breakfast cereals and food based beverages and already many packaged food companies are selling products such as noodles and biscuits fortified with vitamins and minerals this will need to ensure that they are in compliance with the norms before they market the products thank you thank you sir uh, a related question sir uh, you as uh, from the new exigo nutrition point of view you are very well versed with the technological and the logistical concerns that come up so are there any logistical challenges uh, that are faced in the distribution of fortified foods especially in rural areas yes uh, so if you ask me uh, you know uh, we have these large fmcg companies who are having very deep distribution networks um, you know in the rural areas um, especially uh, you know uh, companies like unilever itc and the procter and gamble because they are also selling uh, you know low cost uh, uh, you know easy to use um, uh, products like soaps and um, shampoo packet so i think there is a way to reach the uh, rural market uh, you know in a effective way although there is a lot of uh, focus that needs to be given on the rural market uh, by by companies but uh, in case of uh, the pds which is the public distribution system the mid day meal programs uh, they are already reaching uh, wide and far in the country uh, the through its uh, you know the through the ration shops so i believe uh, you know we have a good uh, way to reach the mass population um, uh, through the fortification of staples uh, you know which are also and also through the public distribution programs so uh, if, if even if you look at this one of these questions um, uh, you know which have which are here uh, you know and i think on the rice uh, fortification uh, yeah do we really need a, a universal mandatory policy for um, rice fortification so yeah by you know 2024 uh, you know india had planned to uniformly for you know supply fortified rice for the food subsidy programs and this has been further extended uh, to 2028 and the motivation is that the indian diets usual meal combinations are insufficient to meet the daily iron requirement and not to forget that every second lady is anemic every third child is hungry and stunted and every fifth youngster is obese in addition more than 70% of the population consumes less than half of the recommended dietary allowance and malnutrition is affecting 68% of india's children under the age of 5 and stunted youngsters earn 20% less as adults than healthy people and it also has a staggering economic loss of 10 billion per year a dollar 10 billion uh, in terms of uh, lost productivity disease and death so we are in danger of wasting two generations since anemia is passed down through generations and has long term implications and rice is the most effective vehicle for supplying micronutrients to the vulnerable populations with 65% of the population consuming 6.8 kg per capita per month Uh, 6.8 kg uh, yeah uh, and then we have an abundance of supply of uh, around 350 lakh metric ton through social safety net programs in india covering 81 crore people in uh, the public distribution system pds 8.5 crore in icds and 10.4 crore beneficiaries in the mid day meal program in india 
So rice fortification could be a game changer in guiding the country out of this problem in a short period of time. And to fight this nutrition dilemma, it can play a key complementary function to diversity, supplements, health, nutrition, and education. And to ensure that everyone is free from hunger and malnutrition, scaling up will require improved quality programs, data alliances, constant monitoring and evaluation, and strong quality control and assurance and gender integration. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We'll take last couple of questions, sir. Um, how can we ensure consistent nutrient levels and consumer trust in uh, fortified processed foods? especially when there is a lot of ignorance or lack of knowledge regarding what age groups can uh, consume it or uh, what kind of uh, lifestyle uh, disease people can consume it. So how would you, uh, what is your opinion on that? Sir? Yeah, so uh, I think, uh, you know, for the age groups, we already have the, you know, RDA levels, uh, you know, available in place. And uh, when it comes to, um, you know, specific age groups, uh, when it comes to fortification per se, so fortification has been, the standards have been designed in a way uh, that ensure the safe intake of uh, micronutrients in our daily diet. So, uh, uh, you know, when uh, the oil, uh, edible oil is being fortified or the wheat flour is being fortified or uh, the milk is being fortified, uh, you know, uh, while designing those standards itself, you know, care is being taken that uh, there is no, uh, you know, possibility of any over, uh, uh, you know, fortification in terms of or, or the over dosage of, uh, you know, uh, vitamins and uh, minerals for the for the population which is consuming that, uh, you know, based on the general uh, consumption patterns, uh, you know, of, of the people. Thank you, sir. Last question. Uh, considering the Indian population, do you think it's a need to go for mass fortification of staples or food products, example, for iron or zinc, etc.? Yes, I mean, it is uh, very important to go for uh, the, the mass fortification because, uh, uh, you know, people are, you know, anemic. Um, uh, there is a need for, uh, uh, you know, these micronutrients like iron and zinc uh, for a majority of the population. And uh, I think the fortification is, uh, you know, the one of the best ways to really address this uh, burning issue. Most of the South Asians, you know, as a population, we are all born anemic. So, uh, I mean, uh, these are the, you know, the only ways. And the, in case of, uh, you, you know, developed countries like uh, Europe and uh, America, I mean, they have been doing fortification for, uh, you know, over 100 years now. So, I think that is the way to go. Thank you, sir, for very patiently answering all the questions in such a detailed manner. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to now invite uh, Dr. Kavita Pandey, uh, a Chodi Biological Sciences from Dr. Khalsa College. Uh, I would like to welcome Kavita ma'am to propose a formal vote of thanks. Over to you, ma'am. Yes, am I audible, Samiksha? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you so very much. Uh, so I get the most important role of giving away the vote of thanks. It said that if you feel grateful to someone, but you don't express it, it's as good as wrapping a gift, but not giving it to someone. So I have the privilege today. So first of all, thank you, Vikram Kelkar, sir, for elaborating on such an important topic, enlightening all of our students respected to this particular domain and guiding them on to how they can take up these challenges for the you know future prospects. Thank you to AFSTI, who's been very vigilant about taking such initiatives and um, arranging such kind of Sherpas and related initiatives, which has been very, very useful for, in general, the overall food techies. A very big thanks to all the dignitaries present in the uh, audience today, Chinmay Ma'am, Srikant Jawalkar Sir, and other eminent scientists who uh, made it a point to attend this wonderful session. Thanks to the chambers for always being partnering with AFSTI in all such initiatives and to all the wonderful audience who had so many buzzing questions about, you know, fortification and the related domains. 
thank you all for making this uh, session a wonderful success. Have a nice day. I formally now declare that the webinar session is over with great success. Thank you very much.